Hello, and welcome to A Reader's History of Science Fiction. I'm Alex Howe, and this is Season 2, Episode 2, Catch-Up Episode Number 1. Is that going to get too confusing with all the numbers? I wasn't sure what else to call it, since there's not really a particular theme to these. If you have thoughts on the matter, leave a comment. I'm calling this a catch-up episode for two reasons. First, there are some classic works of science fiction that I think are important to talk about, but didn't seem to fit into any of the episodes in Season 1. So I want to take this sub-series to talk about some of those. And second, there are a lot of new works of sci-fi that came out during the pandemic that I never got around to reviewing. Mainly movies, but also some books. And this was just a product of working from home for two years, and I got stuck in routines and lazy habits, and even when a lot of the new movies were coming out on streaming, I just never seemed to get around to watching them. So I decided this would be a good time to catch up on those, too. Now, since talking about just one work wouldn't take that long, I decided to try to double up these two categories, at least for this episode. Sometimes it'll be just one or the other for other episodes, depending on the circumstances. But for this one, I've got one classic book and one new one. The classic book, which is really a series, is Cities in Flight by James Blish. And the new book is To Sleep in a Sea of Stars by Christopher Paolini. I paired up these two works because they both center around space travel, space colonization, and at least some space warfare. Although in most respects, they're very different. So let's see what's going on with them. I'll start with Cities in Flight. James Blish was one of the original authors of the Golden Age of Sci-Fi. He self-published a fanzine at the age of 14 in 1935, and made his first professional sale to Frederick Pohl's Super Science Stories in 1940. He briefly served as a medical laboratory technician in the Army in World War II, but they kicked him out for refusing orders to clean a grease trap, apparently. After the war, he started attending a master's program, but soon dropped out to take up writing full-time. Blish wasn't one of the biggest names in the genre, but he does have a few notable writing credits. He's especially known for A Case of Conscience, a novel in which a Jesuit priest visits an alien planet and is disturbed to find alien life forms there whose very existence challenges his faith. I wrote a review of that book on my blog a few years ago. Link in the description. In his later years, Blish, along with his wife, wrote a series of 12 novelizations of episodes of the original Star Trek. And he also wrote the first original Star Trek novel written for adults, the provocatively titled Spock Must Die. However, Blish's most famous work was probably Cities in Flight. This was, in fact, a series of three full-length novels and one fix-up of short stories, all centered around the so-called Oki Cities, which have been ripped from the ground on Earth and fly through space using gravity manipulation technology called a spin dizzy. I've mentioned before that you may notice some parallels with mortal engines. The cities also have anti-aging drugs in their possession, which they guard jealously, and use to build up their expertise over centuries and make long journeys across the galaxy more feasible. As an aside, Blish calls his anti-aging drugs anti-agathics, This supposedly means against death in Greek, by analogy with antibiotic, which means against life. But this is wrong because the Greek root agathos actually means good. It's not clear what he meant by that. Some people think he simply mixed up agathos with thanatos. However, considering that Blish also spelled it anti-agapic and anti-athapic elsewhere, it seems he was just making up roots that sounded Greek without looking them up. Anyway, the Oki cities, of course, were named after the Okies, who fled from Oklahoma to California during the Great Depression. You may be familiar with them from the Grapes of Wrath. The Oki cities similarly fled economic depression and oppressive governments on Earth to try to make a life for themselves in space. But they often find themselves begging for work from the various human colonies around the galaxy, which will hire the city's technical expertise for specialty work. Today, you can often find Cities in Flight as a single volume, but the publication history of the series is complicated. Earthman Come Home, chronologically the third book in the series, was written first, initially as a group of four novellas, and then as a fix-up novel in 1955. These are the core Oki stories, 
showing the challenges the cities face in their day-to-day -day lives, without addressing much of the backstory. All of the stories follow the city of New York, which is really just the island of Manhattan, as it struggles to find work in a new galactic economic depression, then contends with a hostile fleet from Earth in the interstellar equivalent of a fight between police and a homeless encampment, and eventually flees the galaxy for the large Magellanic Cloud to try to settle down on an uninhabited planet. It's not bad as a story, but it does get kind of weird in a few places. After this fix-up was published, Blish next decided to write a prequel to the series showing the origin of the galaxy the Oki cities live in, which became They Shall Have Stars in 1956. This book was... well, Earthman Come Home was plenty political, but They Shall Have Stars tackled much more immediate issues and was pretty clearly a reaction against McCarthyism. In this book, the Cold War has continued to the then far-off year of 2018, and as a result, civil liberties have become eroded away until America has become just as bad a police state as the Soviet Union. Worse, scientific progress has completely stagnated, because everything the least bit useful is immediately classified and compartmentalized by the government. In response to this, Senator Bliss Wagoner begins investing in fringe scientific theories hoping to find something useful outside the usual channels. And, by sheer luck, he turns up both the spin dizzy and the anti-aging drugs. He's still found out by the vicious J. Edgar Hoover-esque FBI director, but he has just enough time to send the first colonies out of the solar system to keep true freedom alive. After They Shall Have Stars, Blish wrote The Triumph of Time in 1959. This is a sequel to the original Earth Man Come Home, but it is pretty messed up the more you think about it. In this story, New York is not that long settled on a planet in the Large Magellanic Cloud and finally starting to enjoy a comfortable life after centuries of wandering, when, in what I think is one of the biggest non-sequiturs in the entire genre, they discover that the universe is ending. Just completely out of the blue. A natural cycle leading to the next Big Bang that just happens to occur barely a century after they solved their other problems. And it has nothing to do with the other, more conventional threat, a mysterious new alien empire called the Web of Hercules that's taking over the galaxy. And so, New York embarks on a final mission. Not to save the universe, no, but to stop the Web of Hercules from exerting its malign influence to manipulate the next universe. Honestly, I strongly dislike when a story takes hard-won plot development or character development and just throws it out the window because some outside event comes in and wipes out all the progress that's happened up to that point. And I know this is one of those truth is stranger than fiction things because the real world is not always this convenient, but it just rubs me the wrong way. I'm trying to think of some good examples to compare this to. Ready Player Two, maybe? Or the ending of How to Train Your Dragon 3? Maybe in Heroes, when the writers threw out a bunch of plot threads halfway through Season 3? I don't mean the typical time travel or memory erasure tropes, or rather not by themselves. Those can be frustrating, but when they're used properly, they're usually in service of something, like preventing the bad future. I'm talking about cases where, on a narrative level, it's like the whole plot up to that point didn't matter. With something like that, it feels to me like the writers lost faith in their own story. So, that's why I think The Triumph of Time falls short. But regardless, there was still one more book after this. After ending the universe, Blish still decided to write a fourth book, A Life for the Stars, which is another prequel, of course, showing the early days of the Oki cities. A Life for the Stars mainly centers around Chris DeFord, a young man who is kidnapped and dragged into the Oki city of Scranton, Pennsylvania as a laborer when it leaves Earth before eventually being traded to, of course, New York. Overall, I wasn't that fond of Cities in Flight. It was good enough that I got through the whole series, but I probably wouldn't have if The Triumph of Time hadn't been at the end. I feel like the politics in They Shall Have Stars doesn't hold up very well either, and while the other two were interesting, they weren't top-notch writing. In fact, I thought A Case of Conscience was better than all of them. So, let's move on to the newest big-name space opera work, Christopher Paulini's To Sleep in a Sea of Stars. Actually, hang on. Checking the dates. Right, Andy Weir's Project Hail Mary is newer. Now that one's much more hard sci-fi, but actually, To Sleep in a Sea of Stars is pretty hard sci-fi itself for a space opera. Even the faster-than-light travel, Paulini tries to put on as solid a foundation as possible under known physics. 
Anyway, Christopher Paolini became famous for his inheritance cycle, which he started writing at the age of 15 with Aragon. That was a fantasy series that also leaned on hard magic, but also on overused fantasy tropes, and it got rather mixed reviews in the end. Personally, I thought it got bogged down in the third book and never quite recovered. He's been pretty quiet since Inheritance ended in 2011, but he had been talking about dipping into science fiction for a while, and with this book, he finally did. To Sleep in a Sea of Stars is about an exobiologist named Kira Navarez, who accidentally stumbles upon the first intelligent alien ever encountered by humans while surveying an uncharted planet. Most unfortunately, this alien, named the Soft Blade, is a shape-shifting skin suit that bonds to Kira's body, and has a tendency to impale everything nearby when it's disturbed. Actually, in retrospect, there are some suspicious similarities to Venom from Spider-Man. However, Paolini does buck the usual tropes in other ways, including by killing off a pretty major character in the first act. And then it gets worse when an armada of alien ships with uncertain connections to the Soft Blade begins attacking humans across known space. The plot gets pretty twisty, and is certainly exciting, although I do have one major complaint that the whole staff of Blue Adventure felt more like a red herring. But what's really interesting is that Paolini plays with new technology in his space opera in ways that I hadn't seen before. Embracing technologies that most authors would shy away from or even portray as a negative. Humans are casually genetically modified for life in extreme environments or military service. Transplanting brains into robotic bodies or regrowing whole organic bodies are standard medical procedures. The entropists form hive minds with no ill effects. And most exotically, starships are run by ship minds, which are not artificial intelligences, but live human brains that are artificially induced to grow to a hundred times their normal size. And this is treated essentially as a lifestyle choice. That was some very creative work that I was excited to see. Now, I do still want to do recommendations in this season. I know I only covered two works in this episode, but this is a special case. The later catch-up episodes will have more. Of the two, I can quite confidently recommend To Sleep in a Sea of Stars. It still has some weak points, but it feels like a significantly more mature work than Inheritance, and it works a lot better than Cities in Flight, so if you haven't read it, give it a look. This has been A Reader's History of Science Fiction. This podcast is available, as always, on all the major platforms. You can find me on YouTube at Science Meets Fiction, where you'll find other science and math-themed videos. I'm on Twitter at SciMeetsFiction, and my website is ScienceMeetsFiction.com. And surprisingly, this is not my shortest script ever. I know I said I'd be doing short episodes this season, but episode 3 was a bit shorter. Time will tell if future catch-up episodes will do the same. However, the next episode will be a full episode, revisiting a topic that I didn't get time to explore fully in season 1. This will be the role of constructed languages in science fiction. Thanks for listening.